Um, what happened there? I'm, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> This video series is not meant to be instructional. It is, however, an invitation to view my journey as I strive to build a log cabin on a budget. Working with sharp tools, felling trees, building log cabins, etc. is inherently dangerous work, which is why they should not be attempted without the proper training, safety precautions, and full knowledge of the associated risks. Enjoy. Sincerely, The Outsider. It was February when I set out on my old snowmobile for the bush. My plan was to break a trail back to the cabin site so that I could try my hand at some winter logging. If I could drop and debark the remainder of the cedars that I needed, I would be able to start work on the foundation in the springtime. I already had 31 logs on the seasoning pile, but my goal was to harvest another 20 before I broke ground. Since it takes at least one year for a log to fully season, I wanted to make sure that I had a good stockpile of material on hand for when it was time to start the build. The cedar bark peeled beautifully in the spring and early summer, but it became almost impossible to debark in the late summer months and fall season. But during the dead of winter, I had no idea how well the logs were going to peel. I wondered if the sub-freezing temperatures would change the characteristics of the sap enough to allow the bark to peel once again. I wasn't expecting it to be as easy as it was in the spring, but I was hoping it would be easy enough. Unfortunately, the deep snow proved to be too much for my battered snowmobile to handle. I spent far more time digging my sled out than I did breaking trail. I thought I stopped hearing it. Hey, you sure did. <laughs> but I persisted, and after having to turn back over half a dozen times, I finally broke through to the cabin site in early March. The first thing I did was check on the log pile to see if the tarp was holding up, underneath the weight of the snow. I was pleased to see that it was. Next, I decided to drop a nearby cedar to see how well it debarked. If it peeled well enough, I would continue on to the next tree and my winter operation would be in full swing. If it didn't peel, then my winter logging would be over before it began. It was time for the moment of truth. Unfortunately, the bark was still extremely hard to peel. My draw knife was the only thing that seemed to work, and barely at that. Even after the outer layer of bark had been shaved away, I still had the stubborn cambium layer to deal with. The bark was so fastened to the log that I had to be careful not to accidentally shave or nick the wood underneath. I tested several different areas on the log, but they were all very difficult to work with. 
I quickly came to the conclusion that it would take several hours at least of painstaking labor to peel each log. This was a far cry from the 15 minutes per log it took in the springtime. Realizing that winter logging was not an efficient use of my time, I made the tough decision to wait until spring to harvest the rest of the logs. Once the snow had hardened up a little more, I pushed further into the bush with my sled, knowing that the chances of getting stuck were significantly less. I took the opportunity to seek out and mark another batch of cedars that I would return to log in the spring. Speaking of which, spring seemed to come fast. In fact, I was almost sad to see the winter season go. Almost. After the spring rains had finished rolling through, I removed the tarp from the seasoning pile and allowed the logs to continue airing out. When June finally arrived, it was time to drop the first tree of the season. I hoped that this time, the cedars were ready for peeling, but there was only one way to know for sure. Immediately after cutting the tree, we heard a thump on the ground about 30 feet behind us. We turned around to see a porcupine scurrying away. We figured that the porcupine was startled out of its tree by the crashing sound of ours, even though it was a safe distance away. Poor little fella. Talk about a rude awakening. It's probably best for the porcupine to move along though, as they thoroughly enjoy eating the cambium layer of cedar trees, among others. If the porcupine population is left unchecked by larger predators, they can do a lot of damage to the surrounding forest. Anyway, I was eager to see how the bark on my first tree was going to peel. Yep, peeling really good this year. Turns out the bark was peeling extremely well. Yep, time to peel. This meant we could start our work for the summer.
Although some trees fell straight to the ground, most of them were still getting stuck. Last year, I tried various methods for getting hung up trees to the ground. I would either use a come along, which was very effective, but it took a long time to set up, was slow to use, and it was heavy to lug around over long distances on foot. The other method involved using a nearby pole as a lever to pry the base of the tree loose. Using a lever was nice because we didn't have to carry it with us, as the forest freely provided them wherever we went, but we were only able to move smaller trees with the lever. This year I decided that there must be a better way to drop hung up trees, something that was light enough to easily transport through the bush yet strong enough to pull even the biggest cedars down. And I did it using just five of these bolts and some rope. The forest provided the rest. Using the bolts, I assembled some cedar poles into a frame. Here's how it works. I set up the frame at the base of a hung up tree, and I tied the base of the tree to the lower cross piece. I then pulled the frame with a second rope, which was fastened to the top of the cross piece. This meant I was pulling the load over a longer distance, which decreased the amount of effort I needed to exert. Bottom line, the frame is a lightweight solution to pulling down heavy trees with a small amount of effort. cedar fell straight to the ground without shifting. It was stuck straight up and down, which is the worst possible position for a tree to be in when it comes to bringing it down. That's because if I wanted to move the base of the tree out from underneath itself, the frame would have to bear its full weight. Although the frame was strong, I wasn't sure it was strong enough to carry the weight of an entire tree. But I didn't have any other choice but to give it a try and just hope that the frame held up.
It took two of us pulling hard, but we were able to shift the tree. I couldn't believe how easy it was. Before, this would have been a situation that only the come-along could have handled. Only the come-along would have taken much longer to use. Just one sec here. The high amount of stress exerted on the lower cross piece is evident in the squeezed and twisted bark. Later on, I made a second frame to improve upon my first design. This time, I added bigger bolts, longer poles, and two lower cross pieces instead of just one. I went for a simple A shape this time, which didn't require a top cross piece. For the lower cross pieces, I cut them flat on one side so they wouldn't twist under the stress, like the round ones tended to do on my first frame. I used the two lower cross pieces as a way of switching between gears, so to speak. The lowest one represented my low gear. It can pull heavy loads with little effort, but over a shorter distance. And the higher cross piece takes slightly more effort to pull the same weight, but it does so over longer distances. I found the ability to change gears on my frame to be extremely helpful. After many days of wrestling with trees, processing them into workable logs, and adding them to the seasoning pile, I feel like I'm finally ready to start the next phase of the cabin build. It's time to start work on the foundation. You're a little over enthusiastic, I think. Really? You're a little over enthusiastic. I 
still filming. Oh. <laughs> Came in a little too hot there. <laughs> Um, what happened there? I'm, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>